Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk today about this classifier uh, and uh, this one, Kenius, Neighbors and Logistic Regression are the three you're going to use for the first assignment. So after this first lecture, you have covered all the, the subject matter for the first assignment and uh, uh, the assignment is already online, so you can, you can look at it. So I'm going to start by talking about the uh, Bayes rule, this is the uh, basic uh, probabilities, and then about the Bayes classifier and the naive Bayes classifier. So the difference between the two and why we're going to use... And why we're going to use the naive Bayes classifier. Then we're going to see a bit about how we can compare a different classifier and I'm going to talk about the first assignment uh, that you'll have to hand in in a couple of weeks. So first, uh, Bayes rule. Uh, let's start with some uh, basic uh, notions, basic concepts here. Let's suppose we have two uh, random variables, x and y, and we have the joint probability distribution. So these are the probabilities of y having some specific value and x having some specific value. We have this sum rule or the marginal probability that, that gives us the marginal probability which allows us to compute the probability of one of the variables having uh, a specific value by adding the joint probabilities of that variable having that specific value for all the values of the other one. So if you want to find the probability of x, for example, being equal to 2, we sum the probability of x being equal to 2 and y being equal to 2, and the probability of x being equal to 2 and y being equal to 3, and so on, and we have this marginal probability, which gives us the overall probability of x equal to 2. The same thing for y, we can add all those uh, joint probabilities and uh, get there the marginal probability of y. We also have this product rule, which tells us, uh, the, the, which relates the joint probability and the conditional probability. So basically the joint probability is the probability of each variable having one specific value and both at the same time. The conditional probability is, is the probability of one variable having some value, given that we already know that the other value, the variable is fixed at another value. So the probability of y having this uh, yj value, given that we know the value of x, is the joint probability of the two variables having these two values, divided by the marginal probability of x having that value. So this we can compute using the sum rule, the marginal probability, and then we divide the joint probability uh, by that one. So basically, these are the two basic concepts here. The sum rule, which gives us the marginal probability as we sum over all the values of the other variable. And the product rule, that tells us the relation between the conditional probability and the joint <coughs> probability. So now, since uh, we can commute the two, so the probability of x having some value and y having another value is the same no matter what the order we consider. Uh, we can write these expressions. So we write the joint probability of y and x as a function of the conditional probability of y given that we know x multiplied by the marginal probability of x. We do the same thing on the other side and we get Bayes' rule. So this tells us that the conditional probability of y having some value given that we know x is the probability, the marginal probability of y multiplied by the conditional probability of x given that value of y and then divided by the probability of x. So basically, Bayes' rule, it relates the two conditional probabilities looking from different directions, so to speak, on the different variables. Now, if we interpret this in a frequentist interpretation, uh, since probability given uh, in a frequency interpretation is simply the frequency of a random event when we repeat it infinite times, this doesn't really uh, 
tells us much other than she thinks uh, the variable we are looking and the variable we are co considering uh, that we already know. Uh, but this is more interesting when we give the probability a Bayesian interpretation. We're going to come back to this uh, later on in the semester. But the idea here is that we do not think of probability as the frequency of random events, but as a measure of some rational confidence that we can have on a proposition. So probability is now not randomness in some metaphysical sense, but more about our certainty uh, regarding some, some proposition or some event, so more episteme epistemical, more about our knowledge. If we see it like this, we can consider that the probability of some hypothesis being true, notice that we cannot talk about this in this way in a frequency sense because hi the hypothesis being true or not is not a random uh, variable. But in a Bayesian sense we can because we are talking about our certainty regarding the hypothesis. So the, hypothesis be, uh, the probability of the hypothesis being true given some evidence that we found would be the prior probability that the hypothesis is true, that we can consider before having any evidence, then the probability of this evidence uh, being found given that the hypothesis is true, divided by the uh, marginal probability of the evidence. So if we have something that the hypothesis predicts very strongly, but would be uh, a priori without the hypothesis being true uh, extremely unlikely, this would be strong evidence for our hypothesis. So basically, when we consider it this way, we can talk about the probability of some hypothesis being true, and we are not talking merely about frequencies, but about our confidence in the hypothesis. So we can talk about the probability of some example, some uh, 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 vector that we want to classify, belonging to some class. So if we're talking about the classifier, if we uh, interpret this in a Bayesian sense, we can talk about the probability of the example belonging to a class. Note that in a frequency sense, this would not uh, uh, be very correct because the example either belongs to the class or not, and this would not be uh, a random event. So when we, when we use the frequentist approach, we talked about the likelihood, which means that uh, if the hypothesis is correct, this is the probability of picking those uh, uh, feature values from all the possible examples that we can appear, because that's what we consider to be the random sampling. But here in the Bayesian sense, we can talk about this uh, probability, the probability of the class being this uh, uh, C, given that we know the features. And we can uh, uh, compute this as the prior probability of belonging to the class, so if 60% of all the universe belongs to that class, this would be the prior probability of belonging to that class. And then the probability of having those features, if it belongs to the class, dividing by the probability of any example having those features. So this would be a way that we could build a classifier. If we can estimate those probabilities, we can build a classifier that looks for, for the probability of belonging to a class and assigns the class to an example that has the highest probability. So this gives us the base classifier. We find the most probable class, assuming that we know the prior probability of belonging to the class, the conditional probability of the, the example of the feature if it belongs to each of the classes, divided by the probability of any example having those features. Note that this marginal probability of any example having those features does not depend on which class uh, it belongs to. It's really just the basic marginal probability of the feature distribution. So since we want to find the class for which this is maximum, we can also ignore this and simply find the class for which uh, this uh, uh, part in the, uh, in the uh, numerator is maximum. 
So basically, we want to find uh, this um, uh, probability here, the, prob the prior probability of belonging to the class multiplied by the conditional probability of the feature if it belongs to the class. And uh, uh, since we can write this as a joint probability distribution, we have the, that relationship. Basically, all we need to know is the joint probability distribution of the classes and all the, the combinations of features. And then we can simply pick the class which has the, uh, the uh, largest probability, joint probability, with any given uh, set of features that we receive. <coughs> so this would be the ideal classifier. If we know the joint probability of the classes and the features, then given any example, we look for the class that has the highest joint probability with those features, and we classify the example in that class. This is an ideal classifier because we, uh, this way, if we can estimate, if we know these probabilities, we minimize the probability of error because we're always choosing the class that is most probable. But this, of course, is only if we know the joint probabilities. And this is the problem here with the, the, this uh, base classifier. Let's suppose we have a simple example. We have a, a, a form, a questionnaire that people have to fill in, and we want to use uh, that information about what kind of food they eat, if they, uh, uh, do ex if they exercise regularly, and so on. We want to use that to predict if they are at risk for diabetes, for example. Suppose that this is a simple uh, form with 20 questions and each question only has two choices, yes or no. So basically we have 20 bits, uh, a vector of 20 yes or no values for each person. If we consider all the combinations, this is 2 raised to the 20, so this is about 1 million combinations. So if we want to estimate the joint probability distribution of all these combinations with the two classes, we will need many millions of, uh, of uh, uh, people answering our questionnaire in order that we can find this distribution. Because we are talking about the joint probability distribution, which means that we have to consider all the different combinations. So this would not be very practical. Even for a simple example like this, we would need a huge set of data just to find uh, the values of the joint probability distribution. So in theory, if we know that uh, distribution there, the joint probability of the, all the features with the classes, we could use this classifier and would be uh, ideal in the sense of minimizing the probability of assigning the wrong class, but this is uh, very unlikely that we can find the joint probability distribution in any reasonable example. So since we don't have usually enough data to estimate these joint probabilities like this, we can uh, do a simplifying assumption. And this is where the naive Bayes classifier comes in. So what the naive Bayes classifier assumes is that if we know the class, then all the features become independent. That is, the features are conditionally independent on the class. This does not mean that they are really independent, but we are assuming that they become independent if we know the class. To give you an example of this difference, uh, consider, for example, the, the, the time two people living in the same building arrive at home. This may not be completely independent because although it depends on, on where they work and so forth, there are some events like a transportation strike or something like that that can affect both. And, and so they are not uh, independent events. It may be that when one arrives later, the other one also arrives later because of that. But if we know uh, about uh, whether or not those events occurred, like some, uh, some big accident or, or uh, a strike in transportation or something like that, then all that remains are the factors that are independent between those two people and, and the time they arrive at home becomes independent. So in general, uh, in real life, it's hard to find something that becomes truly independent once we fix uh, the, the class. However, this is very convenient because it helps us a lot in estimating the probability distribution. And the reason for that is that uh, we can apply the, the, the product rule to the joint probability distribution of the class and all the features. Remember that this x is actually a vector with all the features. For example, the 20 questions we asked in our questionnaire, 
So this would be the joint probability distribution of the class being diabetic or not, and what they answered in question number one and question number two and so forth. So we, we have all these combinations. And we can write this as a long train of expressions of conditional probabilities, which is the, the marginal probability of the class, and then the probability of answering yes or no for the first question, given that he, belo he belongs to that class, and then the probability of answering the second question, given that class and the first answer, and so forth. But if we assume that the, the answers become, uh, lose their relations, uh, become independent among themselves once we fix the class, so if we know the person is diabetic, then we cannot predict one answer from the other, and also if we know they are not, if we assume that, then all these conditional uh, probabilities become just the marginal probability. Because if you have two things that are independent, independent, knowing one of them does not change anything about the probability of the other. That is the, the definition of independence. So actually, we can uh, write, uh, since we can simplify this, and each of these only becomes dependent on the class, we can write the joint probability distribution, assuming that all those features become independent given the class, so they are conditionally independent on the class, this is simply the marginal probability of the class multiplied by the conditional probability of each feature value given that class, assuming that class. And this now becomes a lot easier to, uh, to compute. So since we, are going to, we want to find the class that maximizes this, we can also look at the logarithms. This is very common because if you're doing these operations with floating point numbers, it's very likely that you'll get a floating point under flow uh, quickly. But if you take the logarithms and add them, then uh, things uh, perform a lot better and they behave nicely. So this basically is how we implement, or how we use the naive base classifier. The class we assign to some uh, example would be the, the maximum the class that maximizes the logarithm of the probability uh, of the marginal probability of that class plus the logarithm of the conditional probability of each feature in this example uh, given that class. So how can we do this in, in a practical uh, scenario? For each class, we're going to look at each example so we can uh, separate our data set into all the classes that we have. And for each of the class, we're going to look at each example and find the probability distribution, the probability of having each different value. And also, for each class, we're going to compute the prior probability. The prior probability is simply the fraction, our estimate of the prior probability will be simply the fraction of examples belonging to that class within all the training set that we have. So if half of our examples belong to class 1, then the prior probability of belonging to class 1 is 0 0.5, because without knowing anything else, that would be uh, the probability of falling there. And now, to classify, we run through all the classes. So for each of the class, we co co compute this value. So we use the probabilities, or the logarithms of the probabilities we had uh, computed before, add them all up, add them all to the logarithm of the prior probability of the class, and we pick the class for which this value is higher. So let's go back to the example of the questionnaire. We have 20 yes, no questions, and two classes, diabetic and non-diabetic. So for our training set, we need to know if the person has diabetes or not, and we split the questionnaires into two, two classes. And then for each class, we're going to count how many yeses and no's there are in the first question, how many in the second, how many in the third, and we do that for the diabetic class and the healthy class. And then we have the conditional probability of answering yes or no to each of these questions given the class. Since we are assuming, this is a simplifying assumption, that all those features, all those questions become independent once we know the class, then these conditional probabilities are enough to estimate the joint probability distribution. Now, in fact, it's seldom the case that the, the answers would be independent. So usually the features do not really become independent. However, naive base classifier still works uh, uh, reasonably well because we are not very concerned about uh, computing the exact probability, but merely in finding the class for which the probability is higher. 
So there is still a large margin of error that we can accept uh, by our assumption being incorrect and still the algorithm may work. Okay. So let's see one example with continuous values. This uh, is closer to what you're going to do in the, uh, the assignment. So for this one, I'm not going to show the code, only the, the idea. Let's suppose we have these, uh, these data sets. We have uh, two features, the two coordinates and two classes, the red and the blue. And we want to uh, create a nice base classifier that distinguishes between the two. Now, it's not true that when we assume a class, the features become independent because this is, uh, has a, a quite deep shape and so the features do not become completely independent given the class. However, this is a simplifying assumption that will allow us to estimate the joint probability distribution and still it will work okay. So one way of finding, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, finding the probability distribution given a sample of data is to use a parametric method. A parametric method basically describes the, the uh, probability distribution with a, a, a function and a set of parameters. For example, if you use a, a Gaussian curve, you have the standard deviation and the, and the mean, and you can use that, the sigma and the mean, to, to describe the shape of the curve. And so we can use the, the data set to compute the mean and the standard deviation, and this will give us a parametric description of the distribution. An alternative is we don't assume anything about the distribution, so we don't have a parametric function that we can uh, estimate the parameters, and we uh, estimate the distribution in some other way. For example, uh, we can use uh, kernel density estimation, as we saw uh, in the uh, last week, where we just store the data, and when we add all those Gaussian curves, and we have something with the shape of the distribution of the data, but we are not uh, assuming some uh, parameterizable function for which we compute the parameters. So, naive base can be done either way. Either you can use the parametric model for the distribution or a non-parametric model, we can choose. So, in this example, I'm going to show uh, how we do this with, a, with kernel density estimation, which is the same thing you're going to do in the first assignment. So, kernel density estimation is somewhat similar to uh, a histogram, but we don't define the beans. We add the, the, the Gaussian curve for all the points, so we get something smooth like this. It's higher where the points have a larger density and small, uh, lower where they are less dense. An alternative would be, for example, to use a parametric uh, uh, description of, of the distribution, like a Gaussian curve. So we would compute the mean value and the standard deviation of this data set, and this would be the Gaussian curve. But as you can see, this works best if you have something that is normally distributed. If it's not, if it has, for example, uh, different clusters here and so on, then a Gaussian curve will not be a good description. So in general, if you don't know anything about the distribution, you can use something like kernel density estimation, and it will adapt to whatever the distribution is. <coughs> Now, what we're going to do is, for each class, red and blue, we're going to compute one kernel density estimation, or store the points to, to be able to compute that when we need, for each of the features. So this would be for this feature here, X, we have two distributions. The blue one, which is higher here because there are more blue points uh, in this range, and the red one, which is higher here because there are more red points in this range. And we do the same for the other feature too. So we have, uh, since we have two classes and two features, the product is four, we have four different uh, distributions to consider. So one red in feature one, one blue in feature one, one red in feature two, and one blue in feature two. So this uh, ca we can now use to uh, find, since we have um, a distribution for one of the features and a distribution for the other feature, we can, we are assuming they become independent given the class, so this is only for the red points. And since we assume that these features become independent given that the points are red, this is the conditional independence assum assumption, we can compute the joint probability distribution simply by multiplying them. We don't need all the combinations, we can just uh, make the, a multiplication of the probability values. And this will give us our estimate 
of the joint probability distribution of the feature, both features for the red point. We are assuming that once we determine it's red, then the features become independent. And we can do the same thing for the blue point. So here, the product of the two distributions, we get the joint probability distribution of the blue point. And now you can see how we can, for any point in this plane, look at the height of the, the probability of the joint probability distribution for red and for blue and assign it to the class that has the highest probability. So this is basically how uh, naive Bayes will work. Now one problem that we have is when we use kernel density estimation we need to fine-tune the width of the kernel. So if we use a kernel that is too wide we get something that does not curve enough because we are looking broadly at all the points and if we have a kernel that is too narrow, we get something that is very noisy because we're looking locally and, and uh, changing a lot. How can we do this? How can we tell which uh, kernel width to use? Do you have an idea? Cross-validation, exactly. So we just do cross-validation with our data point and we find the kernel that minimizes the classification error. So this is what we can do. This could be the, the training error, the uh, cross-validation error here. The training error is just, uh, you, you actually don't need to plot the training error when you're doing this, but uh, it's useful because uh, training, the training error should be more or less predictable. If it behaves weirdly, you can look at the code because there may be a bug or something like that. It's not useful to uh, choose the best one, but it's useful to, uh, to be, uh, to give you some notion of whether things are going okay or not. But we use the cross-validation error and we figure out about 1.8. This is the, the best uh, kernel width for this case. And now we train uh, with our naive base with all the complete training set with this kernel width and this is the, the classifier that we get. So this is similar to what we are going to do uh, in the first assignment. The difference is that in the first assignment you have four features and not two. So there's no point in trying to do this type of plotting because it's four dimensional and not, you're not going to be able to, to see them. But these are the plots that you have to, to do because you have to fine tune these parameters. You need to do cross validation to, to choose the parameters. Okay? Now let's see a different example with categorical data. I'm going to show a bit of code here just to, to get you started on the implementation, but this one is different because we are not using continuous uh, values, we are using uh, discrete values, categorical data, and we have a, a database of uh, uh, mushroom description. So we have features like the shape of the cap, the surface, the color, and so on, and each feature can have a set of values, for example, for the cap shape, it can be a bell, conical, convex, flat, and so forth. So each feature has a fixed set of values that uh, uh, it can take, and we have all these 22 features. And then we have a, a data file that tells us whether or not the, whether the mushroom is poisonous with a P or edible with E, and then in order the values for all those features. So this is uh, something we can use a, ni a nice base classifier to classify. Note that it would be hard to do this, for example, with logistic regression because we don't have numerical values. Uh, we, we, it wouldn't be easy to, to find out how to do this. Even with k nearest neighbors, we would have to find the distance metric between the, the feature vectors, and that's not immediately obvious either. So, but with a nice base, it's easy to uh, apply here. What we do is, um, uh, for this example, we go, since we have categorical features, we can simply compute the logarithm of each uh, probability, of each fraction, of how many times the feature occurs, that value for the feature occurs in our data set. Note that for your assignment, you'll uh, be doing something similar to the other example, where you have continuous values, so you use kernel density estimation. So here, what we want to do is, uh, when we want to compute uh, the probability distribution, for example, for the first feature, the cap shape, we will consider the poisonous mushrooms uh, in one group, the edible mushrooms on the other, and for each of those classes, we will see how many times it's X, how many times it's B, and so forth. Some of them appear with a question mark because we don't have data for that, so we're going to consider the question mark as an additional value 
for each feature. So the first thing we can do is to create a table or a list of strings indicating which are the values we have for the feature. So we read this file that has for each line uh, what are the possible values for each of the features and we take the character that appears after the equal sign. So basically we read the, all the lines in the file, we look through the lines, we add uh, the question mark because in the data the question mark can appear in any feature so we add that as a possible value for the feature and then we split in the equal uh, character and take the first character after the equal uh, for each of these fragments. So basically what we're doing is uh, creating a list. These are the possible values for the first feature, the possible values for the second feature and so on. So now we, we know which are the possible values, they are in order and we can convert everything to a numerical matrix which then can simplify uh, doing all the, the computation. So now we need to load the data and the, basically we have the data in this format, so th it's uh, the class in the first column and then the, the feature values. Uh, just going through quickly uh, through the code, we can create a um, uh, matrix filled with zeros which has as many rows as we have examples in our data set, this is the number of lines, and 22 columns because those are the, the features and the class that we have here. Uh, the feature, sorry. We have uh, the classes too, so this would be a vector with as many elements as the lines in the, in the text file. And now we're going to uh, replace the, um, in each line, we replace the, the col uh, column uh, here with an empty character, so we just have the string with all the values. And then we look up in these strings which, are, which is the position of the value we have in each of the strings. So this would be, uh, it will encode the features as numbers in our, uh, in our matrix. So this is just an example of how you, can uh, how you can process this kind of data. We are still dealing with categorical data because this matrix has integer values, but we don't really care whether, whether it's an A or an X and so forth. We just want to know if the, this feature has the first value or the second value or the third value and so on. Now we can use that to count the frequencies of each value on each feature. And here it becomes a bit trickier. Because uh, counting would be simply, uh, we count the, the, the number of times one specific value occurs in one feature and we divide by the number of the features. And this gives us the probability of this feature or an estimate of the probability of this value appearing in this feature. But one danger here is that it may happen by chance that our training set uh, in one particular feature, one value never appears in one class. And if that never appears, then the probability becomes zero and that would be considered impossible by the classifier. But it may just happen to uh, be absent from our training set and not really be something impossible. So zero when you're dealing with probabilities is very risky because you're just saying this can never, never happen. To avoid that, we can use this uh, additive smoothing, which is that we count the number of times a feature occurs, we add this alpha, and we divide then by the total number of examples that we have, plus the alpha multiplied by, uh, multiplied by the total number of possible values in the feature. So basically, we are scaling things that, uh, in order that we don't never have a zero there. If, if it doesn't appear, it still will count a very small probability, but this will be there. Yes? Uh, then alpha, uh, multiplied by these, all of the alphas that we'll use, uh, no, it's, you can have one alpha. So in this case, we are using alpha equals to one, so we put everything, uh, the matrix as one, and we always count something appearing at least one. That's basically the idea. But since we are adding one for each value, uh, so we now have to also divide by that because, because we are adding that to the total number of, of counts that we're going to make. Okay? But you can use another alpha, where one is, in this case, uh, you can choose. You can also optimize that. But generally, you use the same alpha everywhere. Okay. 
So basically, we're going to create a, a matrix pool of uh, the value 1, filled with the value 1, so this will be our alpha. Yeah. The? Because uh, we will be, for each feature, k, okay, we will be adding alpha for each value, of, for each possible value. So, in order to keep this uh, adding up to 1, we have to divide by the total number of examples plus the alpha multiplied, multiplied by the total number of, of, each, of possible values that we have. Because if we have five possible values that we're counting, we're adding alpha five times that, okay? So, uh, otherwise this, this would add up to something greater than one and would not be a probability. So we start with one, then we go through all the data that we have, and we create this histogram by counting each of the possible features. We add one each time we find it. So basically, we here have the histogram of uh, the values of the features in a specific data set. Now we need to do this for the edible and uh, poisonous mushrooms separately, and for each of that class, for each, we have to have one histogram for each of the features. Okay, so now we're going to split in uh, train and test sets. You can use stratified uh, sampling. Uh, the, for stratified sampling, you can use these, for example, train test split, for, uh, as we saw previously. But I'm just going to show this with more codes, doing this by hand, uh, to, um, again, stress this point that sometimes it causes confusion. We need to separate the points into training and test, but we also need to compute the, the feature frequencies to separate the points into the different classes. This is something that you did not do, for example, for logistic regression, because you just uh, put, uh, send all the, the data to the classifier along with the label. But in this case, we also need to uh, separate the edible and the poisonous uh, uh, mushrooms in different blocks, it's easier in order to compute the history. So, to do uh, stratified sampling, we can sh simply take the same fraction of points from the edible and the poisonous ones and put them in the test set. Okay. So now we have the training data for the edible mushrooms, the training data for the, uh, the poisonous mushrooms, and the, the test set for each of them. We can now compute all the the histograms, and in order to classify the examples, all we need to do is to sum up the probabilities or the logarithm of the probabilities for uh, the, the feature value in one example, assuming it belongs to the edible class, and then do the same thing assuming it belongs to the poisonous class. And then we assign the class depending on which one is largest. If the, the, prob the prior probability of belonging to poisonous class plus all the logarithms of the, the probabilities of the features uh, is higher than edible, we assign it poisonous class. So that's class one. If not, we assign it edible class. So now the complete thing is uh, we take lo get the data, uh, uh, split it into training sets, then we build all the histograms for the, the edible poison, the, the edible mushrooms and the poisonous mushrooms in the training set. <coughs> and then we classify all those in the test set to get uh, an estimate of the true error. And here is an example of the confusion matrix and the percentage of error. So in this case, we have a 5.8% error rate. This is the, the uh, uh, one minus the accuracy or the, the percentage of misclassified examples. And you can see here what is the, the confusion matrix in this case. So this is the prediction and this is the actual class. For the edible mushrooms, there are two, 2,089 that we predict uh, to be edible and 15 that we predict to be poisonous. For the poisonous mushrooms, there are 1,737 we predict to be poisonous, but then there are these 221 which are predicted to be edible. And here we can, we can look at this consideration that uh, this is probably a bad idea because this error is a lot worse than this one. So if we don't eat a mushroom because we think it's poisonous, 
that's not a big deal, but if we eat one and it's poisonous, that's bad. So you, the, an advantage of the confusion matrix over simply computing the error rate is that you can evaluate what kinds of errors uh, your classifier is doing. <coughs> so one uh, important difference between naive base and what we saw, logistic regression we saw before, is this difference between discriminative and generative classifiers. Remember that in logistic regression we were explicitly trying to compute the conditional probability uh, of the, the features giving a class. So we are trying to find that function that will uh, allow us to predict the probability of having uh, a point from that class in a specific position. This means that we insert the, the features, we obtain a conditional probability, and we can use that to classify. However, with the naive base classifier, what we do first is we compute the joint probability distribution. We do so in a very approximate way because we are assuming the, the uh, features all are conditionally independent given the class, but still we have an estimate of the joint probability distribution. Now, we can use the joint probability distribution to assign a class to the one that has the, the largest probability, or we can use the joint probability distribution to generate new data points, because since we have this probability distribution, we can sample it at random. So this is why the naive base classifier is a generative classifier. We can use this training set and uh, train the classifier, so using those uh, that joint probability distribution, we can say that we will classify as red everything on this side and as blue what is on this side. But since we have that joint probability distribution, we can also sample it at random and generate points that are distributed approximately uh, like those. So with more red on this side, more blue on this side. So we can use naive base or generative classifiers in both directions, either to classify or to generate data using the same distribution, because we are computing joint probability distributions and not just conditional probability distributions. <coughs> Another problem that uh, you're going to have to solve in uh, the first assignment, and one that starts to appear when we consider different classifiers, is to estimate or to, to try to find out which classifier is better. So let's see an example here. We have the, uh, these data sets. We have a training set and a test set. We use a test set of 45 points. So after training this classifier, so this would be a logistic regression using uh, uh, a higher expansion, so using the, that nonlinear expansion, so it can uh, produce those curves. Uh, K-nearest neighbor classifier, and uh, the naive base classifier. And we can uh, count the number of errors each of one is making. So in this case, in the test set, the logistic regression does 10 errors, so it misclassifies 10 points in the test set. The k nearest neighbor 6, and naive base 1. So now the question is, which one of these classifiers is better? We could uh, immediately say that naive base should be better because it makes only one error, but remember that we are testing this on a test set that is just a sample of all possible points. So the test error is just an estimate of the true error, but maybe may have falls below or above the true error because we are just picking a random set of points and testing that. So in order to be able to tell which one is better, we need to figure out if it is significantly better. That is, uh, have a rough estimate of some interval of confidence where we can say this one is better, or we should say we cannot distinguish between the two. So this is where these uh, statistical tests come in so that we can try to decide which classifier, if a classifier is significantly better than the other. This is a simple one which assumes that the, the error uh, the uh, error that we measure in the set is normally distributed around the true error of the classifier. So the number of errors that we found in the test set minus the total number of points we used in the, set, in the test set multiplied by the probability of making an error should, be, uh, should have this uh, approximate distribution around zero 
and uh, um, uh, divided by this, the standard deviation which we assume to be in this distribution given by, by that value. So basically we are assuming that the difference between the number of the errors we find and the number of the errors we would find uh, uh, in, in average if we have uh, access to an infinite number of points is a normal distribution and now we can find an interval of confidence there for example for 95% uh, confidence this would be 0.96 multiplied by the standard deviation and this would be the interval where we can find. So uh, we could expect that the error that we measured is within this interval of the true error. So in this case, if the true error of logistic regression would be at 10 plus or minus 5 approximately and k nearest neighbor 6 plus or minus 3, we see that these intervals overlap. So we cannot say that one is better than the other and then this, we have this one plus or minus 1.9 so it seems that this one is considerably distant from the other two. Okay? So this way we have an idea of whether the difference is significant or not. A slightly better uh, test is this one, Marsh-Namar's test, which assumes that the, the modules of this count, this is the number of errors one classifier makes but the other one does not, so the number of points that are misclassified by one but correctly classified by the other. And this one is the other way around, so the difference between the two. The modules of this difference, minus one squared, divided by the total number of errors both made, would have this key square distribution with uh, 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 one degree of freedom. So assuming this distribution, we can also find these these magical cutoff points, for example, for 95% confidence, and we can do this test. So basically what we do is we count how many points one classifier uh, made an error in and the other one classified correctly, and then we do the same thing the other way around. We uh, uh, compute the models of the difference between the two, minus one squared divided by the sum of the two, and then uh, if this value is above 3.84, we can say uh, with some confidence that they are statistically different. So basically, if they make the same number of mistakes uh, in points that the other one did not commit an error in, then we cannot say they are uh, significantly different. If the number of mistakes is very different, then we can be confident they are, confident they are different. So when we compare logistic regression with k nearest neighbors, we have a very low value and the same thing for k nearest neighbors with naive base. So these two, uh, these pairs, we cannot say that they are statistically different. But if we go on the extreme, naive base with logistic regression, we get a, a, a larger value. So we could confidently say that uh, naive base is performing better than logistic regression in this case. Okay? So basic idea here is that you cannot just look at the number of errors and be confident that you found the best one. Remember that we are always uh, sampling at random, so these values are just estimates of the true value. They may fall above or below, and we need to have an idea of these uh, uh, confidence intervals. So just to quickly go through the assignment, the first assignment. For this week, you still have uh, exercises in the tutorial class, but you're going to use logistic regression and the cross-validation. So basically, a lot of the code you write this week in the exercises will be useful for, for the assignment. In the assignment, you have uh, four features describing uh, bank notes. So after scanning the, the bank notes, these features are extracted from the images. And uh, the goal is to distinguish between two classes, uh, the fake bank notes and the, the real bank notes. In this data set, they never indicate which are the real bank notes and which are the fake. So you have class 0 and class 1. This is probably for some safety uh, concerns. So you have all these features. You distinguish between the two classes. We never know exactly which one are the fake. But uh, what you do is you're going to use exactly those four features. One thing I would like to remind you is we've been doing, and you're going to do this week in the tutorial classes, this exercise of expanding the features with uh, non, a nonlinear expansion for logistic regression. The reason for doing that is so it's easier for you to understand what happens, for example, in the neural network, in the support vector machine, and so on. 
but in practice we are not going to use logistic regression like that because that takes a lot of work and if we want to do it non-linearly we have better classifiers for that. So in the assignment you're just going to use the features as they are and you're going to, to try them out in the different uh, classifiers. Logistic regression and k nearest neighbors are already implemented, so you're going to use the ones provided in scikit-learn. You also have naive base in scikit-learn, but it's a parametric uh, implementation, so it computes the, the, the Gaussian parameters, for example, uh, to, for, uh, to estimate the probability distribution. So since we're going to use kernel density estimation, you're going to have to implement your own uh, naive base. But the idea is just follow the examples I showed here. So basically, you have the, the example for the mushroom. Uh, you need to adapt it because you're going to use kernel density estimation instead of just counting the frequencies. But the idea is the same. And the, the point here is that you really understand how naive base works, that you have to split in different classes and then split the features and compute the probabilities for each one. So then you need to optimize the parameters. For uh, logistic regression, you have that regularization parameter that you can optimize. For k nearest neighbors, you have the k value. And for your naive base classifier, you have the, the width of the kernel that you're going to use. So all of these you're going to optimize with cross-validation, show the plots, and so on. And then you're going to compare them with McNamara's test and decide if one of them is better than the other. So you need to write a report, you need to send in a PDF file and the, the Python source code uh, in the zip file, but you have the, the instructions there. Remember that you should uh, register the, the groups also uh, until the 7th of uh, October. Okay? So to sum up, we saw base rule and the, the base classifier. Ideally, if we had a way of computing the, the uh, joint, yes? Sim, para registrar os grupos que estão nas instruções lá na página é mandar um e-mail para aquele endereço com o nome do colega, com o número do colega. Estatisticamente diferentes, sim. Não, esse, o, o melhor é aquele que tem menos erro. Agora, será que isso é significativo ou não? So here we saw the problem with the base classifier, which is to estimate the probability distribution. We need too much data if we don't assume anything about the, the relation between the features. But with a naive base classifier, if we assume the features are conditionally independent given the class, then things are a lot simpler. Now we saw parametric and non-parametric models, so in this case you're going to use a non-parametric naive base classifier because you're going to use kernel density estimation. And also this difference between uh, having a classifier that computes the joint probability distribution, that one allows you to generate new data if you want, so it's uh, a generative classifier, versus the distributive classifier like logistic regression. Logistic regression allows you to classify uh, some data points but does not give you uh, new data, does not allow you to generate. So there are, here are some sections about this part and if you have any further questions.